Welcome to the Wizards of Ecom, your no fluff playbook for online success. Each episode is fully packed with actionable tactics you can implement in your business right now. Take your life to a higher level and excel in your online success. It's time to work on you and your business. Let's do this. Welcome back to the Wizards of Ecom podcast. This is episode number 150. Uh, my name is Carlos Alvarez, and I'll be your host for this show. Uh, 150 is a pretty significant milestone, in my opinion. I wanted to thank everyone, uh, my amazing co-host, Noemi Bolojang, as well as um, all, all of you, you know, you listening to this have uh, fueled this pretty amazing podcast, this journey. Some of you have even um, inspired me to start. So thank you very much. Uh, in today's episode, um, I'm writing solo and I'm discussing a topic that was inspired by a panel I was on yesterday, hosted by Jeff Cohen, a friend of mine and just an amazing, amazing thought leader in the space, um, and also Seller Labs, having to do with being at a pivotal point in the Amazon seller landscape. So um, there were many great questions, as is typical of Jeff, and even more amazing answers from the really just really, really amazing panelists uh, one of the questions asked was about what has been working and with, you know, with changes in two, 2021, we felt would not be working. So uh, let me be clear in my head on that. So things that we were doing in 2021 as sellers that worked really well and that we, we feel, in our opinion, would not be working in 2022. So I answered first, I probably should have sat back and, you know, listen, but I answered first and I almost knee jerk reaction, like knee jerk reaction vomited out the chain that, you know, the change I'm working on is with my very manual email version of search find by, um, this was met by like the typical head nods, but I could not get out of my head for the rest of the presentation. Another major change that I didn't get a chance to really dive into one that I feel is much more insidious and that and, and that that thing is compound interest on not getting a mold, which I'll break down what I mean by that in a second. Before I forget, I wanted to take a second and remind everybody that online seller cruise sets sail in 58 days. Um, there are still cabins available. I, so as long as there's cabins available, I have event tickets available for the cruise. Um, we set sail February 5th through the 13th. I would love to see you on the cruise. I know people have been snatching up cabins every single day. So take a second, jump over to onlinesellercruise.com, get your ticket, and just share a pretty amazing cruise full of Amazon thought leaders, presentations, workshops, and just a whole bunch of stuff that will level up your business. So let me, let, let me back up a second when I'm talking about that there's compound interest on not getting a mold. Specifically, um, a mold is something you get to create your product if you're not doing a me too product. So that would be maybe that I'm making, um, I'm going to call it a pretty significant change to the, the structure of the product versus maybe just changing the color or in some cases making it longer. Um, to be clear, I don't want to communicate in this show that the only way to succeed with private label is to get a mold. That's not what I'm trying to say. There are still opportunities out there. They're becoming smaller and smaller where if your only levers that you're going to throw to scale your business on Amazon is reviews and PPC, then I, I find that you're going to have an extraordinarily, um, you know, you're going to have an extraordinarily hard time, uh, finding a lot of products that with those being the only levers in my opinion. So one also in this show, I have like so many things in my head and I want to dump them all out right now. So it's like a struggle to like drop these out in an intelligent way to you. So the, another thing I want to say here is that when I say mold, um, I also, I also mean I'm using it interchangeably with differentiation which differentiating your product to me would be the polar opposite of a me too product. A me too product is you see somebody selling a phone case on Amazon, or you see somebody selling a specific type of, you know, compression sock. And you just pretty much grab that title or something. And you, you find someone on Alibaba or 1688 that's making that identical compression sock and you just order it. And you ordered it maybe based off of some, some metrics you saw, on let's just say helium 10 or jungle scout and 
you were like, okay, I, I can outrank this person maybe with like giveaways or I'm willing to sell for less or s- some other metric that you have in your head that you're going to use to succeed. So for me, when I say on this episode, um, when I refer to uh, the word mold, uh, in some cases I'm talking about an actual mold. And in other cases, I'm just using it interchangeably with differentiation being the polar opposite of a Me Too product. A little bit of backstory. So for me, when I approach sourcing a private label product, um, I'm actively sourcing a private label product right now. It's going to be in the water space. That's all I'm going to say. Um, some really cool announcements coming uh, on this brand in January. But I'm actively sourcing a brand now. Now, what I like to do, what you guys have heard me say, you know, ad nauseum is I like to look for products that I'm passionate about or would like to be passionate about. And then I see if there's a market fit for it on Amazon, right? Obviously, keywords are important. Um, your customer avatar is important, all those things. So to, to one of the other things that I do beyond my criteria, which is like beyond the scope of the show is I look for the defensibility of a product. I want to see how defensible this product's going to be against, you know, competitors. One, uh, w- one of the sort of scales that I use to do this is on one end, we have like from a one to 10, where you have like a one or a two, which is maybe I change the color of my product versus my competitors. Um, maybe I made it a bundle. So for me, that's, that's cool. There's, there's, there's instances where that's important, but that's not defensible because whoever was selling that product it would be very easy for them to contact the factory and change the color. It would be very easy for them to start bundling it, uh, virtual bundles even now just to test it out. So to me, that's very, very undefensible. On the opposite end of that with a 10, we're, we're talking about utility patents, design patents, um, things of that nature. And, you know, closer to that, we have stuff like uh, licensing that you can do with your product. I I think it's a good idea to try to fall at like a six or a seven, right? At at least a six or a seven. Um, A six or a seven is also usually, you know, five through seven where you're actually getting molds for your product. So I think it's regardless if you're going to get a mold or not, I think it's critical now more than ever on Amazon to consider the defensibility of your product before launching your product. Um, Something else that I I add into the defensibility kind of uh, flow in my head when I'm evaluating a product is I think it's important now to consider Amazon. Amazon might start selling your product. Will Amazon, if, if I decided that I was passionate about bath towels and I decided to like create bath towels, um, for me, the kill card of Amazon being my competitor would come up And I would say, yeah, you know what? Every house has bath towels. I could totally see this being an appealing market for Amazon. I believe they are selling bath towels. And I would imagine that the bath towels that they're going to sell are going to be the hottest colors that everyone knows. You know, the blue, the brown, the white. Um, I I think those are the top colors. But when I'm deciding now, I, I, at least I have that plugged in and I'm like, wait a minute, you know, if I do this, there's a really good chance Amazon winds up being my direct competitor on this. It, do I have the stomach for that? In most cases, I would back off at that point. However, if I was just, I have to get into bath towels, if there wasn't in a way for me to differentiate to the point of a patent, or maybe I saw that there was a, you know, a market for like psychedelic or licensing regarding towels that would set me apart from Amazon. If I couldn't find that, I would leave, but I I would look to see if that existed. So that's what I mean by defensibility of a product. I'm going to be getting into a little bit of that throughout this episode. So I just wanted to clear up what I meant by that. And the other one is I host, we're we're about to celebrate our five-year anniversary of the meetup this Saturday. And I'm super stoked. We're actually closer to five and a half years of this group. So think of how many events that is. That's, that's about, it's an average of, we've done over time, I say, just call it an average of 10, easy numbers. So I've hosted over 600 events. It's actually a lot more than that, but over 600 events for, for the meetup group of nothing but Amazon sellers. So I get to hear all kind of questions from all the different Amazon seller models. And, and one 
that has come up a lot. Anytime I'm talking to someone who comes up and they're like, look, I want to get into private label. What do you advise me to do? One of the first things I do, you know, once we start getting into the actual product and I understand their budget and their goals is the defensibility of the product. The easiest spot I see to get into because, you know, waiting for a patent to start's not, not, not realistic in most cases, but one of the easiest parts is getting a mold. And almost every single time the person asks, you know, well, what is a mold? How much does a mold cost? And when I tell them, and you know, for plastics, you're probably looking at something in the 5,000 range for glass and ceramics, much cheaper, like three, $400. Uh, most metals are going to be, you know, in excess of $10,000. What almost all of these people tell me is no, 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 no. That, that's, that's, it's way too expensive. Or, you know, I'm just testing the product right now, maybe later. I, you know, yada, yada, yada. I, I get all kind of stuff told to me or replied to me in that vein. And I'm like, okay. And I let it go. And, and you know, one day after the meetups years ago, I, I was sharing this with somebody and they were like, they agreed. And this was also a, a pretty savvy seller. And I was like, you do know that if you don't pay, I'm just going to use a huge number. Like there's a lot of instances where you do not have to pay this much for a mold, but I stand by my um, by my thoughts on this, on this episode, even with this number. So let's say $10,000, right? So I told the person, you do know that if you, you know, get around or avoid paying the $10,000 to differentiate your product, you you do know that you do pay for that, right? You, You can't opt out of not paying. And this is part of the compound interest that I'm talking about, about not getting a mold. So this, this is what I mean. Um, how about this? Here are the forms of what I feel the compound interest takes form when you do not get a mold. One is going to be higher than normal PPC cost. If you're a Me Too product, you only that's your only lever. <laughs> your image looks almost the same. Imagine you're a blue yoga mat selling in a sea of blue yoga mats, right? You have two levers, price and you have um, PPC, and that's going to be like are you willing to pay more than everyone else to get, you know, prime placement? Um, then you have price, which is going to be how low can you go? Because if no one knows your brand and they're just looking at, you know, they type in blue yoga mat and they just see yoga mats, these next two are going to be the main decision makers and that's price and reviews. So we all know how hard reviews are to get. Um, and most of us, hopefully you listening to this, your goal is not to play chicken with your competitors to see who's willing to make a penny. Right, you you want to make more money, not less. So, one one of the one of the forms you're going to see this in is is higher than normal PPC cost. Reviews is a dangerous game to play. There's only so low everybody can go on price, and at that point, you need to be seen before everybody else towards top of page. Otherwise, you don't get purchased. So, your PPC costs are to go through the roof. Everyone starts paying way too much to acquire a customer, and the blue yoga mat in this instance that somebody buys, they may not buy another one in their lifetime. So it's not like you're getting a client who's now going to hook up, subscribe, and save and continue buying from you, right? So higher than normal PPC cost is one. Increased likelihood of knockoffs. This should be obvious. If your product is available for sale identical all over Alibaba, then it becomes that much easier for someone to just order some and sell it against your ASIN. A friend of mine in the group, you know, relatively new Amazon seller, super savvy, he recently ran afoul of this and it cost him his account. You know, he was just, he had these products. He's like, look, it's identical to the products that are being sold. I'm just going to list against those ASINs that are already ranked. So he did, he got suspended, obviously. That's uh, to the brand owners on that listing. That was a knockoff. And in in addition, it was a form of hijacking. So same thing. You're going to deal with more hijackers when you make the ease or the, you make your product less defensible the, the less defensible and the ease of which somebody can get a hold of your product, the greater the likelihood that you're going to have hijackers and knockoffs. So, so first, first three, PPC, increased PPC cost, um, higher likelihood of knockoffs, higher likelihood of hijackers, increased difficulty in standing out. Again, l- let's just say you're a stainless steel French press. Um, there are a lot of ways that you could differentiate this that you know, would require you to get a mold. And instead you decide, you know, I'm just going to price myself a little less or, you know, some other tactic that's not going to help you succeed as an Amazon seller. So 
you have this identical French press. So now it's going to be that much more difficult for you to stand out. There are some very few exceptions that I'd like to point out here. Like, um, you know, Anthony Confrancesco from PicFu, he's got some great examples of some cool stuff that you can do with your, your main image and your images to stand out. If you are in a, you know, a category where all the products look the same. Um, there's also a really cool case study that Thrasio has having to do with angry orange and how they just change the color of the bottle to be so different than what the accepted industry norms were for colors of these like carpet deodorizers. So there, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, you're going to have a much, much more difficult time standing out. Uh, finally have a race to the bottom on price, which we've alluded to throughout the show so far. And that is everybody's products nearly the same. So you race to the bottom on price and everyone gets to a different price. And then pretty much whoever's buying the larger quantity and has their logistics really dialed in, has a better landed cost and is able to drop their price lower. That's what, and factoring in PPC, if they even know to do that. So, um, and the last one, I feel like this is one that doesn't get talked about much. And it's because so many people do me too products that it sounds, uh, almost like, uh, I think it's a subject that people intentionally avoid. And that is this no other choice mentality towards a black hat or riskier tactics. So what I'm all for email marketing, building community, Amazon live video. You guys hear me talk about this all the time. However, if you have a me too product, you've already launched it. You already have the product. It's going to be very difficult to incorporate a lot of these strategies because you just have a boring me too product. There's nothing special about your product. Um, the, what happens here is if you have this boring me too product, you wind up saying, okay, well, email's not open to me. Amazon live video is not open to me. Well, you know, what's open to me. And it's, you know, whether it's rebates or whether it's, you know, some other hack that, you know, is not in line with Amazon's terms of service and you put your account in jeopardy. You know, you try to get extra reviews from some review groups, but you put your account in jeopardy. And in reality, in reality, there's no other choice mentalities, sort of like it's sort of true because you don't have any other choices here. You could just hemorrhage PPC and make every sale that you do get be at a loss, or you can adopt one of these other like um, hacks. So I don't want this to be doom and gloom. So I want, I want to show you a little bit of a reversal. Pretty much everything that I just said if you do differentiate your product, and obviously you've picked a product that is uh, of high quality, um, you've done your research to make sure that um, there's a market for it, um, the reversal is also true. So you'll have lower than normal PPC costs. You're less likelihood to de- you're, you're, you have a less likelihood of dealing with knockoffs. You have much less of a likelihood of dealing with hijackers. You have a decreased difficulty in standing out, or, or said another way, it becomes much easier to stand out you can command a higher price and you have endless options to scale. So you're, you're listening to this show. So there, there's, there's a huge likelihood that you are as passionate about brand building as I am and probably equally geek out about all things e-com. Um, today's episode is hopefully super inspiring to you as it's meant to be. Um, as either Sharon Evans or Jeff Cohen said on yesterday's webinar, selling on Amazon is not necessarily harder right now. It just requires you to have a broader skill set to profitably scale it and turn it into an asset worth exiting. Or if you're like me and you get real cheesy with it when you first start passing the torch on uh, the family business for generations to come, I'm, I'm really rooting for you. I'm here for you. I would love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Um, what do you see as having worked for you in your business this year, but may not work in 2022? I really, really want to know the answer. And I love hearing from you. Feel free to reach out to me uh, in our telegram chat at amazongroupchat.com. In the meantime, stay strong, stay connected. I hope you're crushing it in your life and your business in Q4. And I look forward to talking to you next week. It was fun sharing this episode with you. If you found value in what you've heard, please show your love with a subscribe rate and review of the show. Until next time.